Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. She's iconic and inspirational. It's really important that so many little girls can see dolls that do everything. She's a role model and an object of hate. She stirs debate around empowerment, obsession with beauty, and insanity. Barbie is so thin, it would be biologically impossible to survive. And she is so much more than a doll. If the toys you're playing with don't look anything like you, then what is that telling you? In 2023, Barbie is brought to life in a wild and quirky comedy directed by a feminist filmmaker of all people. Does Barbie still matter today, and did she ever? For over 60 years, Barbie has embodied the American beauty ideal. Athletic, super slim, blonde. Her biographer, yes, Barbie has a biography, put it like this. Barbie teaches women what, for better or worse, is expected of them in society. But who would come up with such an idea? The woman that created Barbie and sort of, you know, infused her with her very progressive ideas was, was a trailblazer and a feminist. It might come as a surprise that Barbie was actually a German invention. Long legs, big eyes, and a blonde ponytail. Barbie's ancestor, Lily, wore high heels and skimpy clothes. She was born in the 1950s as a cartoon character for the tabloid newspaper Bild. Soon, the drawing became a three-dimensional doll, looking more like a pinup than a children's toy. Perfectly shaped little dolls, in this case better suited to older children, at the traditional toy fair in Nuremberg. The doll was also sold in Switzerland, where a fateful encounter took place. In about 1956, my husband and I took a vacation with my daughter Barbara and my son Ken and we were in Switzerland. And there was a display, but I saw this adult doll. It was exactly the kind of doll that toy entrepreneur Ruth Handler wanted for her daughter. One she could not only play mommy with, but one for which she could dream up an exciting life. One she could, wow. Barbie is single, childless, and confident. In 1959, that was a very modern image of a woman. Ruth Handler was way ahead of her time. So it's, you know, 50s, 60s, very, very conservative when Barbie's being invented. Ruth Handler was a Jewish feminist who was working at a very young age, and she was working at Paramount Pictures as a teenager driving around. She picked up the guy that she liked, Elliot Handler, who she wound up marrying. She proposed to him. From then on, Lily was renamed Barbie after their daughter, Barbara. But Handler's company wouldn't buy the rights to the Lily doll until 1964. 300,000 Barbies sold in the first year, and the doll is still one of the best-selling toys in the world. Barbie laid the foundation for the success of Mattel, which built an entire universe around her. Yet it wasn't until 64 years later that Barbie came to life on the big screen. So cool. And then there's Ken. A beautiful man for a beautiful woman. Since 1961, Barbie has had an infinitely loyal and therefore rather boring partner. Put a mustache on Ken and make believe he's the bad guy. Or sideburns and play he's the hero. It's Ken. This doll, too, was named after one of the Handler children, their son Ken. From now on, Ken will be Barbie's sidekick. The guy in her long pink shadow. What are you doing here? I'm coming with you.
Did you bring your rollerblades? I literally go nowhere without them. Although he tries to keep up with Barbie's fashion, he always makes a slightly underwhelming impression. And let's face it, Ken doesn't stand a chance against Barbie's glamour. Barbie never married Ken. He was only the boyfriend. He was the accessory. Barbie was always the star. A woman who doesn't have to get married and doesn't have to have kids and has her own great house and has her own great car and I think has her own airplane at this point and her own boat and, you know, gets to be with Ken when she needs a date but then doesn't need him most of the time. I think that's, I think it's pretty cool. Doesn't seem to matter what I do. I'm always number two. Oh, oh, I, I have feelings that I can't explain. Driving me insane. Cause I'm just kidding. Hi, Barbie. <laughs> Ken, it has to be said, rarely makes the headlines. But in 1993, the earring magic Ken doll triggered one of the few Ken controversies. With his fishnet shirt, leather waistcoat, and jewelry, this Ken proved unexpectedly popular with the gay community before Mattel took the doll off the shelves. Too progressive for the kids' rooms after all? Ken does have one small flaw, at least as a doll. And it's something that women, or Barbie, should be aware of. He has no genitalia. Oops, and why is that? I'm actually not sure. Wasp waist, atomic breasts, endless legs. Let's be honest, who looks like that? Even doctors say not all organs would fit into Barbie's body. Her breasts would be so heavy in real life that she would have to crawl on all fours. Feminists say she's not a suitable toy for little kids. And those feet. Barbie is everything we didn't want to be and were told to be. But that's not all. For many feminists in the Western world, Barbie embodies an image of a woman that is meant to perform. Barbie is maybe not the norm, but already a step in the construction of this norm, of the young, white, thin, non-disabled body, which is ready for action in a capitalist world, because the fit body also stands for the performing body, which you can do what you want with. The problem is, Barbie stands for a beauty standard that can put pressure on young girls, who then starve themselves in order not to become overweight and to look as beautiful and perfect as their Barbie doll. There's scientific research to support this. I think that the Barbie brand is so fundamentally tied up in a really unhealthy ideal of femininity, um, of what it means to be an attractive woman, a good woman, a worthy woman. And, and, you know, I think Mattel can change Barbie's clothes and they can change the packaging and they could make her body moderately more realistic. But I'm just not sure that there is escaping, you know, that history. Um, and that when you're putting these dolls in the hands of, of little girls around the world, there is a message there. And that message is, you know, this is some kind of ideal. Yet despite all the criticism, Barbie continued to sell really well. But then Mattel made a mistake. In the early 90s, it released a talking Barbie. Talk about the talk. Now Barbie was also certified stupid. That was one step too far for the Barbie Liberation Organization, which took a subversively ironic look at the downtrodden doll, as well as her male counterpart, G.I. Joe. Both toys replicated stereotypes. So I worked with a bunch of people, first transplanting the voice boxes of Barbies and G.I. Joes, and uh, asking friends around the country to join the organization and send the toys in so they could be uh, operated on and sent back to be put back on store shelves. And so um, they were sold again for Christmas, you know, to a bunch of unsuspecting people. 
I donated my voice to a G.I. Joe, because they want to be free, too. Want to go shopping? They were sick and tired of uh, being, um, of, of sort of, uh, you know, being stereotypical. They, they wanted to do things that were different and unique, just like many of us do. So they rebelled against the company that made them. <laughs> it made the national news. Another holiday shock, this one under some Christmas trees. Why are G.I. Joe and Barbie talking like each other? Ask a friend to come along. G.I. Joe wants a friend to come along to the dance. But everybody else seemed to really like it. That was the, the really the big surprise, is that most people who saw this thing were kind of in favor of the Barbie Liberation Organization. Because once you see the toys doing what they do with their voices switched, it becomes obvious what's wrong with them. We have uh, G.I. Joe, and um, let me see what he says. I'd love to plan our party with Skipper on the weekend. Yeah, I'd love to plan our party with Skipper on the weekend. <laughs> I've got troops. Troops, attack the Cobra Ninja at the command post. Ultimately, the Teen Talk Barbie was a flop. Regardless, Barbie's success story continued, especially that of the original doll, white, blonde, and extremely slim. Barbie's fans might argue that the pretty little doll wasn't stupidly waiting for Prince Charming, but worked for a living from an early age, and not as a secretary either. She's a doctor, a dancer, a dentist, a pilot, or even a president. Whatever the job, of course, she has the perfect outfit for it. I think it's simple. I think it's you could be anything. You could be anything you want to be. You don't have to follow. You don't have to be a mommy taking care of little babies. You don't have to get married. Uh, you don't have to have your father or your husband supporting you. You could support yourself. You could do anything you want. You could have one of hundreds of careers. Uh, you could have your own place. You could have your own car. You could have a fun, wonderful, amazing life. If you want Ken, cool, he's there. If not, throw him under the bed and, you know, go <laughs> rock and roll with your scientist girlfriends, you know? A clever message by the toy giant Mattel. Now they're saying, we want to inspire and empower girls. That's why famous women are being immortalized as Barbie dolls. The painter Frida Kahlo, the astronomer Maggie Adder and Pocock, the primate researcher and environmentalist Jane Goodall, even the recently departed British Queen has a Barbie. And hey, Barbie looks just like the astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti. It's a great promotional coup by Mattel with a simple message, girls can go to outer space too. Um, so I do think the company has really tried to shift who Barbie is to reflect what parents want for their daughters uh, and for what young girls kind of see and understand as normal and not outdated. But I do think, you know, Mattel and Barbie are always like, a couple paces behind <laughs> the <laughs> movement. Okay, okay, Barbie is running a bit behind the zeitgeist, but the zeitgeist is running behind her, too. This painting of Barbie by Andy Warhol is fitting. Consumption is exalted as high art, her mere likeness turned into a spectacle. Other artists use Barbie as raw material to play with the stereotypes associated with the toy. Artist Dina Goldstein takes a series of photographs that show Barbie and Ken living together. Both dreaming, but not about each other, about a different hot guy. And then there's this, an unsuspecting Barbie catching Ken in bed with a man. A very different kind of dream house. No one has as many Barbies as German collector Bettina Dorfmann, who owns over 18,000, making it into the Guinness World Records. When museums in Tokyo, Las Vegas, or Berlin want to put on a Barbie exhibit, they usually get their dolls from Dusseldorf. Barbie and fashion are inseparable. 
Even world-famous designers like Karl Lagerfeld and Moschino have dressed the blonde doll or become a Barbie themselves. But this one's not a doll that everyone can afford. The cult of Barbie also produces some bizarre phenomena. Some people are willing to do anything, including pay millions to look like Barbie. That's what you call devotion. And then there are also men who would like to look like Ken. Rodrigo Alves has undergone several procedures to accomplish the look. Now, going by the name of Jessica, she wants to be Barbie instead. Calling all the wannabe Barbies, Kens, and Dreamhouse fanatics. The movie has also produced some real estate, and it's available to rent on Airbnb. In 1968, the year that civil rights leader Martin Luther King was assassinated, was a time of severe racial discrimination in the USA. The first African-American Barbie was introduced. Her name was Christy, and she was Mattel's statement to the moment. Yes, black is beautiful. But Christy wasn't exactly the same as Barbie. Mattel's narrative is one thing, where they are very progressive with introducing a black friend for Barbie. Um, through our lens, through the story in which we enter it, you know, the Black woman lens, while that feels progressive, for them, it feels less progressive for us um, in the sense of um, for 21 years, there wasn't a Black fashion doll worthy of the Barbie brand name. Legeria Davis made a documentary about the history of Black Barbie. Her aunt was one of the women at Mattel who convinced Ruth Handler to expand Barbie's universe for the inclusion of African-American girls. So the lack of Black dolls for them, uh, once they started to see them, then they want to like, oh, they love them, you know, um, that's all they ever really wanted when they were little were pretty Black dolls, you know. The first Black Barbie goes on sale in 1980, finally. Black Barbie represents the doll, like represents um, my aunt and Kitty Black Perkins and the other Black employees at Mattel being seen. It's like validation of being seen and heard. But Black Barbie is nowhere near as popular as her blonde sister. Even in some African countries, little girls prefer to play with a pretty little white doll. And that's where a Nigerian entrepreneur steps in. My daughter, when she was around three, you know, she asked me, um, she said, Daddy, um, what color am I? Um, I'm like, okay, I know you know the answer. And then she had a long face. And I was like, um, why? Um, she said, well, I wish I was white. And I'm thinking, why would you think, why would you wish you were white? She says, oh, because white is pretty. How could any father not feel sad hearing that? Taufik Okoya got active and launched a new line of black dolls in Nigeria in 2007, the Queens of Africa. I'm just trying to say, look, it's more than beauty. You need to have much more, you know? And also saying that, look, I can have my hair straight, I can have my hair curly, I can have it in plaits. It's my identity, it's who I am, you know? And that was a message that was behind, you know, the Queens of Africa. The queens of Africa now corner the doll market, at least in Nigeria. They're affordable and they're also African, with natural hairstyles and dressed in colorful traditional patterns. Dolls that people from Nigeria and other African countries can identify with. You start through play. Um, and if I'm able to get, you know, a child to like my product, they like what that product stands for. And that product should be able to enlighten and teach them something.
We've said it before, Mattel is trying to keep up with the times, and that means greater diversity. Now Barbie can be lots of different things, like Muslim, Chinese, in chemotherapy, in a wheelchair, with a prosthetic leg. Barbie can have Down syndrome. Finally, there's a curvy Barbie, which is technically an average size. Studies now show that even when forms of objectification are meant to be positive, to complement women's appearances, for instance, that still tells girls, okay, it's all about my looks. And that can make them see themselves as objects. When it comes to Barbie's marketing and the way the products are portrayed, I still see only minimal attempts to break away from this intense focus on appearances which lies at the core of this damaging marketing concept. But guess which Barbie is still the best seller? Mattel does have an image to consider. Thrilled to see it. But I still think at its core, at its root, the Barbie brand is a pretty anti-feminist, you know, pretty uh, unhelpful ideal for girls. And I would bet that a lot of women of my generation are not giving their daughters Barbies. So I think that the fact that uh, Mattel is willing to keep reinventing and uh, rethinking and reimagining, I think is a good thing. So the focus is no longer on being skinny or, you know, going to beach parties. The focus is on, you know, the, the dolls that um, are modeled after famous scientists and, you know, famous doctors and famous designers. So so I think that there's been a little bit of a shift in terms of um, even the advertising. But try as they might to adapt Barbies to real life, many young customers go from loving to hating Barbies. Played with Barbie since we were like five years old. Oh. In 2005, there were media reports of a strange phenomenon. In the United Kingdom, numerous cases of Barbie dolls getting tortured came to light. The renowned Bath University published a report that girls between the age of six and ten were torturing their Barbies in every way imaginable, or even completely destroying them. The researchers found that the girls thought their Barbies were useless, but it's not a new phenomenon. As a little kid, I would cut the noses off my Barbies and cut the hair off. And um, as I said, instead of changing the clothes on the tiny Dawn dolls, I would change their heads. And I met a psychologist. Uh, she was actually a sex therapist named Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan. And at one point when we started talking and I told her what I did to my Barbies, she said, that's why you're healthy now, because you took out all the aggression on your dolls. So, you know, play when you're playing as a kid, I think taking your aggression out is, is, is probably a good thing to do. Susan Shapiro still has her childhood Barbies. She even wrote a book for Barbie's 60th anniversary. So don't worry, Barbies still have a purpose for many. Nothing lasts forever, even if Barbie lives her best life. But where does she end up? That's right, in the trash. They say three Barbie dolls are sold every second, and that really adds up. But Mattel wouldn't pass up an opportunity to bolster its positive image. In 2021, it launched a Barbie made of 90% recycled plastic. Barbie loves the ocean. The problem is that you can only recycle plastic two times maximum three, so those toys that have already been recycled once are going to end up disintegrating just like the rest of their plastic toys, and so it doesn't get rid of the problem. Recycling is part of the problem. Recycling is greenwashing when it comes to the plastics they're using. Give that some thought, Barbie. You can go back to your regular life, or you can know the truth about the universe. The choice is now yours. The first one, the high heel. You have to want to know, okay? Do it again.
In Greta Gerwig's film, Barbie Land is a candy-colored paradise with no death, aging, or getting frail. But then Barbie becomes so human. This is the best day ever. It is the best day ever. So is yesterday, and so is tomorrow, and every day from now until forever. Do you guys ever think about dying? I think it really by uh, not just denying that she's full of controversy, I think that that was part of what was so interesting about her was that, you know, in some ways she's been ahead of culture, in some ways she's been behind it, but she's definitely been the topic of conversation for 64 years. And that's why Barbie matters, because she's still evolving. And she really ought to be able to age gracefully, too. But one thing is certain, good old Ken will keep on loving her unconditionally. Are you a Barbie fan, or have you always hated Barbie? What's Barbie Land still missing? Let us know in the comments.